Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. It's amazing when this thing's upside down, it's kind of crazy. All right, that makes a lot more sense. Now, in Mark 11, I don't want to keep continuing to go over what we were going over, but in Mark 11, 22, it's, again, it was the last couple of days of Jesus here on the natural life in his physical form. And he said to have the God kind of faith. He commands us to have faith. And you think about that. Again, what is faith? Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. And on, uh, I think it was Friday, we got to go into the studio at Fact TV and, and talk a difference of fear and faith. Fear and faith is actually opposite, but they operate the same. And I've seen a lot of fear across our country this year. And so it was an interesting teaching. So in Mark 11, I just want you to see here, it goes on. And for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast in the sea, shall not, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith, it shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Just a few things here. Notice the word believe is in there one time. Notice speaking is in there three times, and we're going to talk on that a little bit today. But just to go over it a little more, just over there it says, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. They're both commands. They're pronouncement imperatives. In the Greek language, what that meant is once you said it, it's done. So if I command my mountain to be removed because he's given you faith, the God kind of faith, and your true faith statement, when you say, be thou removed, it's removed. Think about that. Even though it's still there, you command it to be removed because it happens first in the realm of the spirit. you got to understand it works from the inward out. The enemy works from the out to in. But we were, the God's designed it that he leads us by our spirit, not by our reasoning, our, our logic, not by our feelings, but he leads us from what in our spirit so we got to see that that when you actually say to your mountain and I said to you when you wake up and all of a sudden you don't feel good that's your mountain that's the mountain that you're facing at that moment if you say be thou removed and be cast into the sea what you basically just said God has given you the faith through hearing of his word and by faith when you say be thou removed it's removed because right after that, it says, if you doubt, what is doubt? Doubt is picking it back up in your mouth and speaking your mountain. And James says, I'll just read that to you. In James, it says, a double-minded man receives nothing of the Lord. And we got to see that. That's why a lot of people are frustrated. Because one moment, they're speaking the word of God over their life, their faith. And the next thing... They're speaking their mountain. And what do you say that really is? It's not really faith. It's mental assenting to the word of God. Because faith never changes. Faith does not change. It's always the same. So if you're changing, that means it's not really faith in your spirit yet. You're only mentally agreeing to it. You're only mentally assenting to it. Because it says this, knowing this, that to trying your faith, James 1, 3, worketh patience. We're going to see that in a moment. But let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and tired wanting nothing. If you lack wisdom, ask God, and he gives to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. That's the same word as doubt. In Romans 4, it's staggering. So you're wavering when you pick up the mountain and you speak your mountain again. What's the Bible say here? It says it's like a wave that's driven with the wind and tossed for that let not man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. Because why? He's a double-minded man. He's unstable in all of his ways. So one moment you, you, you speak your faith, you speak the word of God, the promise of God over your life. The next moment you're speaking your circumstance over your life. God calls that being double-minded. He calls that unstableness. Why? Because you don't have it all the way into the, into the foundation of faith yet. Faith is solidly on the promise of God. And then I need to go a little farther here so we can start teaching on this. It says, but 
But believe, there's I believe, that those things which he saith, there's a second say, will come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Not what you believe, but what you speak. That's where a lot of people lose their battle. Because in Romans chapter 10, 8 through 10, it says you believe in your heart and you confess your mouth. There's a lot of people that believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. There's a lot of people that believe that. That Jesus Christ did, was resurrected from the dead, but they don't really believe in their heart because they would be confessing it over their life. They would make that truth their truth by believing and speaking it and living it out, doing that word that they're speaking. But no, just because you believe, even the devil believes. I don't know why the Spirit of God does this to me, but over in James it says that he, even the devil believes, and he trembles at the word of God. Think about that. He trembles, but he doesn't speak the word of God of his life. He reasons it out. He does everything he can to disown it. It goes over here. It says that, yeah, thou believest that there is one God, that do is one. The devil also believes and trembles. So the devil also believes that Jesus was raised from the dead. Why? Because it defeated him. It crushed him. He said in 1 Corinthians 2, 8, if I would have known what he would have done and what he has done to me, I would have never put him on the cross. So you have to understand that there's believing is simple. Believing comes by hearing the word of God, looking at the word of God, studying the word of God, putting your heart. But when the mountain comes, that's when you're going to win or lose. Because a lot, it's easy to say, oh, I believe that God heals me or God delivers me. But when that mountain arrives, what do you speak? What do you say at that moment when the mountain is face to face right before your eyes? What do you say? I can guarantee you most people that I've been around, they speak their circumstances. They begin to believe what's happening to them because they meant to ascend it to the Word of God and they truly don't believe. And Jesus said the only cure of that is you've got to keep casting the seed, the promise of God's Word that you want in your life. Even if you fell at that time and moment you spoke your mountain, you keep casting that seed, that promise into your spirit over and over and over. You don't have to understand why, how the seed of God's work. I don't know how you put a little radish seed in the ground and all the next 10, 15, 20 days you have a radish. I don't know how that works. But I do know this, that when you plant it into the right soil, give it the right water and nutrition, it's amazing that it will germinate. And where does it germinate? Under the ground. Where does the faith of God begin? In your spirit. So you've got to keep casting the word of God, which is seed, uh, Luke 8, 11 says the word is the seed, the seed is the word, and the word is Christ, is Jesus, and so you keep casting that word into your life. You keep casting that word into your life because mountains are going to come. And when that mountain comes, it's up what you speak at that moment, if that mountain is removed and cast into the sea, where it grows stronger in your life. Now, before I get into the truth today, I wanted to share, and again, I didn't bring my Greek. In Romans chapter 14, the day I teach it, I don't bring it. In Romans chapter 14, this is interesting. Before we get into teaching faith, this is where a lot of people make mistakes. I want you to see what the Spirit of God says. In chapter 14, verse 22, How has thou faith? That's not what it says in the Greek. It actually says, uh, have it to thyself, and before God, we'll just keep it in King John, bring it next week. Blessed is he that condemns not himself in the thing which he allows. So what he's saying here is have your faith before God. Because it's a personal relationship with God through the word of God. Because if you confess the word, if you put it out there, the enemy has the right to challenge you. And if you're not established in faith yet, I can guarantee you, you're going to sink. Just like Peter did, said, Lord, save me. And Jesus reached out and grabbed him and saved him, called him, O ye of little faith. You got to understand that when you begin this walk in faith, you only have to have it before you and God. You don't have to confess to anybody what you're believing. It's a personal thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual fight. And you're in the midst of that fight. So you got to understand that it's between you and God. You know what I'm saying? You have to walk it out before him. Because I've seen a lot of people confess something like, oh, 
I'll never get sick or I won't do this or I won't do that and next within a month or two boom they're in it and they, people will say well what happened what happened so you don't have to make that confession if you follow the woman with the issue of blood when she pushed in she kept saying within herself she said that instantaneous presence she said when I touch his garment when I touch his garment I will be healed that was her faith within herself she didn't have to she didn't have to tell anybody she just told herself in herself she began to believe that when she touched his garment she would be healed she didn't go around and tell everybody that was around her hey when I touch his garment I'll be healed when I hey look at me when I touch his garment I'll be healed God's not real impressed with that what he's impressed with that you yourself believe because you're speaking that when you touch his garment, you will be healed. Then what did Jesus do? He stopped, power went out of him. Because faith touches the power of God. And this is how we begin to know God in our life, more presence of God in your life. Because when he begins to answer your prayer, it's either coincidence or it is God. And when he constantly keeps answering your prayer, you can't keep saying it's just a coincidence because the reality of it is, is you took the word of God, you showed it into your spirit, you began to confess that over your life. And when that mountain hit, you spoke your faith to that mountain to be removed and cast in the sea. So virtue went out of him. And she said within herself, she felt that she was healed of that plague. She literally felt the tangible, the palpable presence of God, the spirit of God, the power of God, the wisdom of God went into her spirit and manifested into her body and she, she felt that in herself she was healed. Then Jesus looked and said, somebody touched me. Then the testimony came. Then the witnessing to the word came. Because why? It's a private thing to them. Because it's a battle. It's a fight. And you got to understand that you might be in the middle of a fight and losing at that moment. And if you can telling everybody, guess what the part of the battle they're going to see? Your losing part. <laughs> Not the winning part because the world is based upon the God of this world order and he's negative. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's a liar. He's deceiving. So if you get caught up in that, you get caught up in your confession more than you do your faith. Confession is just releasing your faith. And so what you need to understand is a private thing. Jesus turned around and said, somebody touched me. Peter got so irritated at Jesus and said, who? There's hundreds of people touching you. You want me to tell you all their names? Because you didn't understand that the way to touch God is through faith. And think about all those hundreds of people that touched Jesus when he hit the shore and Jairus came and fell before him, prostrated him, said, would you come heal my only daughter? From that point of the shore to Jairus' house, remember, he's the pastor of the church, one of them, there in the middle of that walk, a woman touches him. But there was tens of hundreds of people touching him, but nobody received anything. Only one woman received from Jesus because she instantly said her faith. She believed in her heart, and she said out of her heart, within herself, when I touch his garment, I will be healed. Then Jesus looked right at her, and I believe the conviction of God came upon her. I can't imagine if Jesus appeared to you today and looked into your soul what you would do. You know, I think about that. He's pure love. And pure love would look right into your eyes. What would happen to you? And she fell to the ground and began to confess to her everything he did. She gave her testimony after she received her healing. Are you listening to me? Because what happens a lot of times, we begin to get, we think we're bigger than we are. Or we don't understand the rules and the law of faith. And so we can give our confession before we receive our answer. And what happens if you don't receive your answer? You know what people are going to say to you? You know what you said because you did it already. And they said, oh, I thought you were healed. I thought you were delivered. I thought God did this or God did that. She could go around bragging all she wants after that because she was totally healed by the power of God. Amen? Then Jesus said, just to finish that, be of good cheer. When I think of good cheer, I think of the uh, uh, sitcom Cheers. And I didn't really watch it, but I did a few times. 
and they would go cheers, you know. And uh, that's not what it's talking about there. Cheers there means continue to be bold and continue to be confident. Because why? Because the devil's going to come back and test you to see if you truly received your blessing. So the one point before we get in, and I want you to understand that it's a private fight. No one has to understand your fight. You don't have to explain your fight to anybody. It's between you and God. Because you're taking God's promise and you're beginning to sow it into your spirit and it takes time for that to develop and God knows where you're at spiritually. And you got to understand in Mark it says that that seed will begin to germinate within your spirit. Just because a radish plant comes up out of the ground doesn't mean I yet have radishes. It has to continue to grow and then produce the flower, which produces the radish. And then when that little red ball's sitting there, it looks like a little radish. You can harvest it whatever size you like. But then you harvest it. And it's the same way spiritual seed works. You keep sowing that God's promise into your spirit. Eventually, the Holy Ghost will water that spirit, that word, in your spirit. Eventually, it will root into your spirit and will become a part of your spirit, man. You will actually truly believe that you receive. Because if a mountain hits you and you say, Oh my God, I'm sick and I'm not going to get whole. Or I, I can't make it because I have no strength. Because the Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But because of the mountain, you think the mountain is stronger and bigger than God. And you confess your mountain. Right there, a double-minded man receives nothing of the Lord. doesn't mean you sinned. It just means that you're not yet in full faith or the faith that God desires for you to have. Have the God kind of faith. I just wanted to share that in the second part before we teach. I want to go over to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6. Because a lot of people, they don't know, am I supposed to share my faith? Am I supposed to speak my faith? No, you don't have to tell anybody what you're believing. That's between you and God. And it goes on there and says, I don't want to talk the rest of that. I'll wait till I get to Greek next week because it's interesting. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and 12, it says, fight the good fight of faith. The first fight there is a command. It means you're to enter in the opposition. You're to enter into the struggle. And so what the Bible is teaching here, what Paul's writing to his pastor, to one of his young pastors, is it's going to be a fight. Faith isn't going to be easy. It's going to be a wrestling match. It's going to be a fight of the realm of the spirit. The devil's not going to let go just because you spoke a word of God over your life. you got to hold on to your faith, and I'm going to show that in a moment. Faith is going to be a fight. It's going to be a wrestling match. And it's going to be against the realm of the spirit of the enemy. He will see to it that he gives you a good punch. He's going to see to it that he harasses you or persecutes you or bring weakness, sickness, death, whatever it might be into your life. But I want you to get the concept that it's a fight. The first one there is command. Fight the opposition. Fight. Fight the adversary. Fight the mountain that's coming against you. Then it goes on, the good fight of faith. It's a fight of faith. And I thought about this. If I go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it begins to say this. In verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So our fight isn't going to be a physical fight. It's not going to be a mental fight. It's not going to be a reasonable or logic fight. It's going to be a fight of the spirit man. The spirit man wants the word of God within it to rise up and to overcome whatever mountain is hitting your life. But I want you to know that it's going to be fight and it's personal. And the enemy's going to make sure that it's personal. And some of the personal fight is going to hurt. It's going to be low blows. And you've got to get familiar with this, that the enemy is familiar with your circumstances. So he's going to hit you low and hard. So I want you to see here in 2 Corinthians 7, for the weapons are for are not carnal, but mighty, to God to the pulling down of strongholds. Because if you continue to allow something to, to manifest in your life without fighting it, it becomes a stronghold in your life. I've seen Christians in circumstances that are so strong, they're holding them in a position they can't get free. They ask everybody to pray. They, 
They go on fastings. They go to every seminar. They go to every minister to lay hands on them. They go here. They go there. But it's a stronghold. You can't break it. And I want you to see there that we're entering into a realm of a spiritual fight. And it's not of the flesh. It's of the spirit. And the enemy's been around a long time. He knows how to fight. You're just starting to fight. You're just starting to get a hold of the word of God. So listen what it says here. Pulling down of strongholds. Notice here that the stronghold is in your mind, not your spirit. Because when you're born again, the Spirit of God does a spiritual operation on you. He takes out of you that nature of sin, that spiritual separation from God, and he replaces it with a seed. The seed is the divine nature of God. It's Zoe, God's divine life. The seed is called Christ. Christ is the wisdom and power of God. And 2 Corinthians 1, Ephesians 1, and 2 Corinthians 5 all tell us that that anointing is sealed in us. So God has sealed into us the power and the wisdom of God that we need to win every battle that we face. But the enemy sealed out. He's not allowed to touch your spirit. You've been born. You're not double-minded. You're not double-natured. You don't have the, the nature of Satan and nature of God. I remember when I first came into the charismatic move, some people thought they had the nature of Satan and nature of God in them. And they, and they could never get, they were very confusing. And I, and I began, that's what searched me out. And that's why I preach so hard that when you're born again, you become a new creature in Christ. All things are passed away, all things become new. The Spirit of God did a spiritual operation on you. He took out of you that nature of sin that was passed down to you through Adam, through your mom and dad, and he took that out and replaced it with the divine nature of God. 2 Peter 1, 3 says, Now you're partakers of the divine nature of God. How do I partake of it? Through the precious, exceeding precious promises of God's Word. That's where you understand. That's the fight that we begin to fight. We want what God gave us as an inheritance for us to have in this life, not when we get to heaven, but to have in this life. There's 130 scriptures promises alone in the New Testament that guarantees you your inheritance that you received when you were born again. Name me ten of them. I guarantee and most Christians say that I've been born of the Spirit, my name's written in the book of life, my sins are forgiven, and when I die I go to heaven. That's it. That's it. There'd be a couple other ones that know a couple more. But there's 130 scriptures alone to teach you what Christ gave to you when you said, Jesus, come into my heart. You were placed into the body of Christ. He removed out of you that nature of sin and death, placed you within the divine nature of God, baptized you into the body of Christ, and gave you two inheritance. One, the promises of the inheritance you could walk in every day of your life, and the dominion and authority that you have in the name of Jesus. It's an amazing walk. But because we, through the pulpit, haven't taught the people all the full gospel, we think just because you were filled with the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues, you received the full gospel. No, the full gospel is walking out what God gave you through his death, burial, and resurrection and promised you with his word. That's your inheritance. And we need to find out what it is. So we're learning these things. Amen. And so I want you to see here, it says, weapons of our warfare are not carnal. You will never beat your mountain by physical, physical means. You can... You can subside them a little bit. For example, if, you, if you, you're full of care and worry and you can't get, can't get rest, yeah, there's antidepressants. If your pain is, body's raging in pain and, 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 and you can't get, your, it can't get your freedom, but there, there's pain medicine. And there's nothing wrong with that. I get, I get a crack out of people because they'll say, you, you know, they'll get off on healing. And, and I always come back about... Uh, Needs, you'll say, my God supplies all my needs, but they go to work every day. Well, if I believe that by his stripes I'm healed and I use medicine to help me to complete my healing, what's the difference if I believe God just blow on my knees and I go to work? I don't see the difference. Because it's a growth in faith. You've got to grow in faith. You keep growing and exceedingly till you get to the place where you don't have to go to work. You can actually believe God for your needs. That's almost far-fetched, isn't it? But read the story of George Moeller. He did, I don't know how many people, of orphans, and only two times, two times, the children, after he prayed, had to walk away from the table with no food. Two times. 
And both times with less than a half an hour, somebody showed up with food. He never told anybody how he was running his ministry. He ran it by pure faith. He didn't work. He didn't put out any kind of, he didn't give out, see, please help us. He didn't send out any of those things. He didn't tell people his needs. He kept it unto himself. He did it between God and himself. He had his faith between God and him, and God honored his faith. He never asked anybody, and God always supplies his needs. There's a realm that you can reach where you can walk, and God supplies your need. Look at Elijah. I know it was a little wild that Elijah, the ravens, brought him food, but God supplied his need. So when it comes to healing, just think about this. Don't get off on somebody just because they use doctors and medicine. It's no different than you believe in God for, for finances and you use a job. I guarantee you most of the jobs you're using, it doesn't do the will of God. Come on. And so I just wanted to share that with you. It's not carnal. It's not carnal. You've got to keep putting that word of God in you. You got to keep putting that word of God in you. You got to keep putting the word of God in you and find the promise that you need. Find the promise you need. Now hold on to that. I hold I had you to hold on to three things now, right? It says casting down imagination. That's where your fight's going to be. It's not going to be in your spirit. Your spirit's sealed. You're born again to the day you die, you'll go right to heaven. But your fight here in the natural realm starts in your mind, in your soul, in your will, your mind, and your emotions, your feelings. Your battles of this natural realm. Satan's the god of this world order. He's not the god of the spiritual realm. He's the god of this world order. His fight and his power is of this natural realm. And he's familiar with you. They're called familiar spirits. He's familiar with your weaknesses and your strength. Guess where he's going to hit you? In your weakness. He's going to hit you when you're down, you're weak. When did he hit Jesus? When he was hungry and tired. Didn't eat for 40 days. And guess what the very first thing the devil hit him with? Oh, turn those stones to bread. How hungry are you? <laughs> and so I want you to see here, it says casting down imagination, reasonings, logic. Satan's going to use your logic and your reasoning, and he's going to inspire your thoughts against the Word of God. That's going to be the battle. That mountain's going to hit you, and guess where it's going to hit first? In your soul, in your reasoning and logic. First thing I said, oh my God, I don't feel good. Why? That's my logic, my reasoning. But my spirit said, by his stripes you're healed. I sent my word and he healed you. Count your benefits. Not only does he forgive you of your sins, but he heals you of your sicknesses. But the very first thing you do is you, you're in the natural realm. You live in the natural realm, so the very first thing he's going to hit is your logic, your reasoning, your body, your feeling, your emotion. And you can get caught up in that and never win a battle. You can become an emotional wreck. You can become so full of feelings that are contrary to what God made you to be that you get angry at God. Let's go on. Every high thing that exalts itself against that your reasoning, against the knowledge of God. Isn't that interesting? He's not warring you. He don't care about Smokey. He could care less about Smokey. But what he's nervous about is that Smokey gets a hold of the image of God, which is Christ. Christ is the wisdom of God. Christ is who defeated him. If you get a hold of Christ... Here, let, let, just go back 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Let me show you something. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, look at what it says here. It says, In whom the God of this world, that's Satan, has blinded the minds of them that believe not. He doesn't want you to believe. He doesn't want the word of God to rise up in you. He doesn't want you to walk in faith. See, over in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, We don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. But most Christians walk by sight and logic and reason. But Paul said, through the Spirit of God, God wants you to walk by faith. You get into a deep mountain, I guarantee you, most of your confessions are going to be out of what? Reason, logic, and feelings. But there's a way to defeat him. There's a way to destroy that mountain that every time it rises, you remove it and cast it in the sea. And that's by speaking the Word of God, speaking the promise of God instead of what you see. Let me show you. Okay, and it goes in here and it says, unless, what's he nervous about? Unless the light 
the understanding, that's what light means, darkness is ignorance, light is understanding, the understanding, the glorious gospel of Christ, the wisdom and power of God. He doesn't want you to understand the wisdom and power that's sealed within your spirit. He'd rather get your mind off of the circumstance and the mountain that he's hitting you with. He wants to overcome your life with a mountain that you can't get out of. And it will happen to every single one of us. Each one of us, life will come, and it's those that get a hold of the Word of God and find the promises that deal with the circumstance that you're stuck in. Don't, don't plant pea seeds if you have a whole freezer full of peas. Why do you want more peas? But if you need green beans, plant green beans. If you're in a life and you're struggling with sickness and disease, start finding promises that deal with sickness and disease and God's divine healing and begin to meditate upon them. It says, because the image of God your son, him, the image is what he's scared of. That image is Christ in you. He doesn't want you to understand who you are in Christ. He doesn't want you to understand the wisdom and power that you have in Christ. Because I love to go down here. In verse 7, we have this treasure in our earthly vessels. What treasure? All the wisdom and all the power you need to walk a successful and victorious and triumph life in this life. But what the enemy will do, he'll get you and blind your mind by circumstances or mountains, and you can't get out of it. Because all you see is your circumstance. All you see is your mountain. And all you confess is your mountain. And he said, a double-minded man will receive nothing of the Lord. God can't help you. Isn't that sad? But over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it goes against the knowledge. But what he's coming against is your seed that you're sowing. And I want to show you this before we move on. i got one thing I want to show you, and I'm running out of time. In Mark chapter 4, notice there, let me finish this so we don't have to come back here. It says, against the knowledge of God, bringing to captivity. That means a prisoner of war. Do you think, it says, fight the good fight of faith, and it talks in there, it's a fight. Could you imagine walking up to your enemy that has machine guns and knives and daggers and say, your aunt, come on, let's go, we're taking you home, we're taking you put in prison. No, it's a fight. And some men will fight to death. It's a fight. You've got to understand this. You're entering in, faith is a fight. Faith is a struggle. Faith is a wrestling match. Faith is is struggling out of Satan's world order rule and coming over into Christ that you've been spiritually changed into and became a new creature. And the enemy does not want to release you to walk into that freedom and liberty that you have been made through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's going to fight you all the way. And don't think just because you begin to speak the word of God over your life that you're not going to have no problems. That's when the real fight stops. That's when you really begin to understand the very uh, struggle and the very fight of walking with God. Because Satan's not going to let go his ground. He's not going to give you an inch. The devil said this, you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. You give him your shirt, he'll take a jacket from you. There's going to be a complete fight. Now watch this in Mark chapter 4. It says this. Notice there it says, uh, I already forgot what it said. It said, against the knowledge of God. Now notice in Mark 4, verse uh, 15, these are led by the wayside, the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan comes immediately to take away the word, the knowledge of God. Why does Satan hit you? To take away the knowledge of God. What does he hit you with? It talks in here, sickness, disease, weakness, persecution, cares of the thrill, lust of other things. It goes on and on and on and on. Because he knows where your weakness is, and he's going to hit you there. He's going to drive you away from the Word of God of sowing it in your life and meditating on it, and he's going to get your mind and your thoughts and your reasoning back onto your mountain, back into your weakness where he's hitting you. And that's the fight. That becomes the struggle between you and the Spirit of the living God. Now go down. It says uh, in verse 17, they have no root in themselves, but for a time they, they endure and they ri it rises for the Word's sake. What arises for the word? The fight. The fight. Satan is so nervous that you're going to get a hold of God's word and won't let it go. It's called the sword of the spirit. It's the fight that you're going to have. It's the fight of your life. Some things is going to be life or death. I shared with you how I won against liver cancer. 
you got to hold on to that word of God. Doctors were against me. Uh, X-rays were against me. Blood taking was against me. I mean, it was a battle. I lost the first round. I went 11 months on the treatment, and six months later, they told me it didn't work. Do you quit? Do you quit? Do you get caught up and say, well, I'm a loser. I guess that's my life. I can't do anything different. No. You begin to sow that seed. You keep sowing that seed. You keep putting the word of God in your heart. You stand on the promise. Let me get to over there. And then the last one, it goes on and it says, um, and the cares of the world, verse 19, deception of riches and lust of others, entering to choke the word. Notice there the whole battle, your whole fight, is holding on to the word of God. Satan's going to keep bringing things into your life and hit you hard while you're young in faith, and he's going to want you to pick up not what the Word of God said, but what the mountain says. I guess I'll never win. I guess I'm a loser, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But God wants you to speak the Word. Romans chapter 10, and we'll go to my sermon. And Romans chapter 10, this is just to interlude into it. Because you have to understand, this is a private fight. I can't even ask Brenda to get involved in my fight. It's between what I desire of God, what I want God to do in my life, what I need God to do in my life. Brenda has nothing to do. She can't feel what I'm going through. I can't feel what she's gone through. When she had breast cancer and beat it, she fought cancer two and one. But I, I don't know what she's gone through. I saw her cry. I, felt, I, I picked it up. I, I love her. I might even shed a tear or two. I went down with her. But I can't help her. I don't have the power to be cancer. I don't have the power to be sick and disease. I can agree with her faith, encourage her. We're two agree on earth. It's touching anything. It shall be done. But it's her fight. It's her body. It's your fight. It's your body. It's your realm. It's your life. you got to fight it out. And so in, over here in Romans chapter 10, just to show you the principle of it, in verse 8, what saith the word is nigh thee, where in your mouth? Where's the word of God? In your mouth. What does the devil want to change? He wants to change what's in your mouth. He wants you to talk your mountain. He wants you to talk the circumstance. And right there you lost a battle. Right there you lost. Because the faith is you've got to keep it in your mouth. That is the word of faith we preach. But if you confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall believe in your heart. That God raised him from thou shalt be saved. When you begin to speak it out of your mouth, you release faith by speaking. Now go with me to Romans chapter, Hebrews chapter 10. I got a few moments. I'll break it open this morning. In Hebrews chapter 10, and the reason I never touched this verse, because I read it in the Greek and it bothered me. It bothered me immensely. I thought there was an incorrection in the Word of God. <laughs> you say, what is it, brother? I'll tell you. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, says, Let us hold, uh, and I wanted to show that to you. In 1 Timothy, it says, Hold on. This is the second time the Word of God says this. It says, Let us hold on. Let us hold on. I keep thinking about when we were in this... Uh, in a situation, there was waves, and it was uh, crushing our boat. And the only way to get above that water was to hold on to the boat. And if you don't hold on, you're going under. You could even drown. So you hold on. You get the picture. You got to hold on. You got to hold on in the middle of a spiritual fight. You got to hold on. Look what it says in Timothy six twelve. It says, "Hold on to eternal life. That's Christ in you." you got to hold on to what God put in you, the wisdom and power of God, because Satan's going to try to blind you to that so he can defeat you. Once you pick up the mountain and begin to speak your mountain, you're lost. You absolutely are going to be sick. You're going to uh, not have freedom right there. And most people say, well, I, I thought by his stripes I'm healed, but I'm sick. Well, you just lost your fight. It's going to be a fight. He's just not going to relax just because you spoke something to him. He's going to fight you for it. It's his turf. He's the world order. He's the God of this world order. He, he's not going to want you to get on the principles of Christ and walk free from your circumstance. He's not going to let you go. He's going to fight you. But thank God, in Luke 4, it says he finally finished 
that season of fight and left Jesus. He won the battle. And what did Jesus say? It is written, it is written, and it is written. Three times of those three attacks, he spoke the word of God to the face of the enemy. He held on to the anointing in him and on him. He held on to it by speaking to the face of the enemy the word of God. Now, let me show you this. I thought this was wrong, so I wanted you to say, hold on. And that means so you can possess it and own it. you got to hold on to it because the enemy's going to come and steal it from you. He's going to try to take it, everything you have, so you never mature in Christ, that you never receive a benefit from God. He wants to make your walk as dull and dry and, 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 and victorious he can make it. And it's up to you personally to get in there and fight your fight and understand it's a personal fight and that Jesus is on your side. He's the word. He's in you. You keep putting that word in you so the Father God can react to your confession. You speak. He said, have the God kind of faith. Believe, but speak. Whatever you believe that you speak, you shall have. Romans, Hebrews 10, it says, let hold on. Profession there is the same word as confession in the Greek. So I'm going to say confession because that makes more sense to me. When I think of profession, I think of a job. You know what I'm saying? But uh, it says, let us hold on to the confession of our hope. That's what it says in the Greek. And I, I struggled with that. Matter of fact, I never taught this till today. But I began to write this out. I wrote a book on faith. I'm finally getting it written out. I'm going to try to get it produced. But it's a confession of your hope. And I was thinking, why would it be confession of hope? Let us, it's a command there, let us hold on to the confession of our hope. I thought faith is what we get our battles won on. But guess what spiritual hope is? Spiritual hope is God's promise. Because when you're in a battle and Satan is pounding on you, contrary to what you're believing, the Bible says when that mountain hits you, like I got up Sunday morning, I was sick as a dog, at that moment it's going to pivot on my confession. And since I'm not walking in faith at that moment, I'm walking in a battle, I'm walking in a spiritual fight. What is my weaponry? What is my weapons to win? The Word of God. What was the Word of God that I put in me to fight this fight? The promise that God promised me in His Word. So at that moment when you get hit very hard with a mountain, you're going to have two things to confess. You either confess what you see, feel, hear, smell, touch, whatever's crushing on you, you can speak your mountain or you hold on to what? The promise of God. You speak at that moment God's promise that produces faith in you. Isn't that good? You hold on to that confession. You're either going to speak God's word at that moment or you're going to speak your mountain. If you speak your mountain, you lose. But if you start to speak the word of God, it turns to battle. It turns to fight. On your behalf, God can now begin to battle for you in oneness with you. And God already defeated Satan. He brought him to naught. He paralyzed him through his death, burial, and resurrection. But for you to lay hold of that, what Christ put in you, what God put in you, that anointing and wisdom and power of God, if you want that to bubble up and spring up into every life and be a power for your life, at that moment, in the greatest midnight, you've got to say the promise of God. You've got to hold on to the seed of God because that's what he's trying to blind you to. Hebrews 6, I got uh, about 45 seconds. So we'll just touch this and pick up on it next week. In Hebrews 6, if you go over here, and we, des and we desire, I can't really do this. In 12, do not be slothful. That there means lazy, not meditating on the word of God. You want to go into a battle without preparing your weapons. Most people find out how much weaponry they have, how many bullets we have, 
how many hand grenades do we have, how many missiles we have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You don't want to get in the middle of a terrible battle and have no ammo, <laughs> no weapons. Follow me? But somehow as Christians, we walk into the battle with no weaponry. And Satan, just, he's going to hit you the same way. He never changes. But what I don't have time to take because uh, my time's over. Look at me at chat, uh, 18. This is Hebrews 6, 18. That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we have a strong consolation who, who fled for refuge to lay hold, there it is, to lay hold upon the hope that is set before you. You got to lay hold of God's promise. When that mountain hits you, no matter what that mountain is, no matter when it hits you, what time of the day it hits you, you got to lay hold of God's promise. So that's why you put that promise of God in you. That's why you sow that promise into your life. Because in the middle of the battle, your only weaponry is God's knowledge, God's truth, God's promise. So lay hold of it. And notice what else it says here. It says, which hope, the confession of God's promise, becomes the anchor of your soul. Why? Because the battle is in your soul. The only way you're going to anchor yourself, the only way you're going to be able to push back, the only way you're going to win your battle is knowing the promise of God when He's coming to steal the knowledge of God, when He's warfaring with images contrary to the Word of God, when He's taking your mind on a journey contrary to the Word of God and to the promises of God, you got to stop that flow and stop it in the name of Jesus and speak out of your mouth the promise of God's Word. It's the anchor of your soul. It's what's going to anchor you in that storm. It's going to what be able to plant your feet on the Word of God. And we'll pick up that next week. Because what, what it ends up saying goes on and says, Who let, fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, 19, which this hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into within the veil. Isn't that good? Nobody taught me these truths. And I was out there a few times and got walloped. And through those wallops, I've learned these principles to apply to my life. So I lost the first round with liver cancer. And what do I do? That's a shock. I sat there, probably drained. I was white, ghost. They told me there was no more medicine. There was no more hope. They told me to go home, just eat a good diet. Don't drink. Don't get high. Don't be stupid. Don't treat your liver good. Treat it like your best woman that you have. Sorry, Brent. And so anyway, treat it good. And I put my faith out. I kept speaking what God told me to speak. I held on to that anchor. I held on to my hope, the promise of God, that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead will quicken or make alive or heal my natural body. And guess what? Within six months, I got a phone call. And the phone call came zero, 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 zero. So I thought it was a joke. And it kept going on and on. For two weeks, finally, I get a letter in the mail. University of Kansas from the liver doctor. Mr. Farkas, you're not going to believe this, but we have your, uh, what's that genetic type, Geno, whatever. We have it. We can't believe it. It came in. We don't even know where it came from. Come on in. We have new medicine. Amen? But at the time when I left the doctor, they told me nothing for maybe 10 years. And you go away. What would you be thinking? Am I even going to be alive in 10 years? I had two or three friends die of the same disease because we were stupid we did stupid things together and so we were all dying together two or three of them are dead why am I special I'm not special because I got a hold of the promise of God and I began to speak it to my circumstance and I told the devil you're not going to take me because I have the promise that the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in me was it a fight yeah it was a fight but guess what I waited nine months after the second treatment. I went down to University of Boston because the doctors that I were under were against me. They told me I'd never be healed. They would never even gave it to me. He started calling me all kinds of names. So yeah, I was a minister, pastoring a church. But he only looked at my past. And he's spitting in me and telling me to write out a will. He brought Brenda in and told him to write out a will, her to write out a will and all that because I was hitting the bucket. What do you do when you come out of doctor appointments like that? I come out bummed, 
But then the Spirit of God quickened to me because I was meditating on those scriptures. I kept sowing that scripture into my spirit. I kept looking at it. Literally picking up my Bible. It wasn't being slothful like I said in here. I kept looking at it. said, by the same spirit to raise Jesus from the dead, the same spirit to raise Christ from the dead, dwells in me. And guess what? Nine months later, I call, and guess what? They said, I lost your paperwork. I thought, oh my, now i got to wait some more weeks. And the mind games in that, the mind games that go on. See, he's going to put imaginations in your mind. you got to cast those imaginations. you got to bring your soul to peace on the promise of God. you got to get the word of God into your spirit, the promise that he gave you, and hold on to it. Lay hold on to it and keep speaking it to your mountain no matter the cost. And they called back and said, you are totally healed. There's not a lick of cancer in you, and we don't ever see you getting it unless you do stupid things. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Father God, that you have caused these promises in my life and Brenda's to come to true. And I know, Father, in my heart that we're speaking the same promises of your word over this church, and I know it's going to come to pass. Why? Because it's a, it's, it's a battle of the imagination. It's a battle of a reason and logic. It's a battle between us and the realm of the Spirit. But I thank you, Father, that you have given us promises to hold on to. They become anchors of our soul. It, it settles us in the midst of a storm, in the midst of our greatest battles of life. We can have total peace because you give us peace, not as the world gives us to it, but as the Father. That word of God just brings peace. And I can stand in the greatest valley. I can stand in the greatest battlefield of my spiritual life and know that you have my back, Father, because you're with me. Because you're in me, you've given me your word, I believe that word, I stand on that word, and I thank you that that word has, has brought me the victory in my life. And I thank you, Father, for everyone that's here, everyone that's listening to this sermon. And Father God, that you begin to quicken this truth into our spirit. Open our eyes of our spirit, that it, this is for every person. It's not just for the chosen, it's not just those that they think you love. But it's for everyone that's ever been born of the Spirit has a right to take the Word of God, the promises that you have spoken, take that promise that deals with our life, plant it into our spirit, begin to believe and speak it our life, because that mountain is going to hit. And when that mountain hits and we speak your promise, we'll begin to see victory and triumph in our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. All right. Brenda said